So I love a project with a strong theme, and I think you get high marks for achieving that with this album. And uh, what was your inspiration in, you know, I mean, aside from the obvious things, but what was your inspiration in putting this album together? Sure. Um, well, I've loved Wes Anderson's films for a long time. That's that's definitely part of it, and especially the way that he uses music in film and the choices uh, about his music in film. I mean, that there's this mixtape vibe to the music that he uses. Yeah. Um, and then just sort of got me thinking of the concept of a mixtape as sort of a placeholder for, uh, you know, how we feel, how, what, you know, how it feels to be who you are um, in terms of giving a mixtape to someone in, in a way, sort of like saying, this is who I am. This is how I feel. This is how it feels to be me, or this is how I feel about you. Mm. Um, and so there's playing with that. There's all these levels to it in one sense, like the, the songs that I've chosen for this album are, are my mixtape. These are the songs that are important to me and, and they're, they're connected to Wes Anderson. Some are a little bit more, tangentially because you know uh i picked the song cello song by nick drake on my album which is not actually in one of his movies but nick drake is and this is my favorite nick drake song um then there's this element of you know wes anderson has created this such a specific style so being able to skin that album in this style allows me to you know play with so much uh, take this my audience and sort of immerse them in this world and and sort of give them a, a culture a shared cultural reference that we can you know have together and then the the third thing i think is is sort of you know the way i'm thinking about the songs on this album is they're not so much covers uh or even you know like a postmodern jukebox idea where i've taken a song and placed it into another style right i think of it a little bit more as my themes and variations like I've taken these well known uh, themes these melody bits of melody bits of rhythm and harmony from these songs and I've taken that as my starting point and sort of made my symphony with it you know and 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 that's how I sort of introduce an audience to to my world of you know music making and and uh, try to start in a place where we have some sort of shared reference uh, and you know go from there right and i like the idea of the playlist or the mixtape i i think if i'm thinking about our ages i'm probably a little older than you so i re do i remember really cassette tapes you probably yes. do too I do a little you bit. probably made a lot of cds i made yeah. a lot of cds and, and mini discs <laughs> right 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 and uh and i guess what do the kids do nowadays they do like a playlist on spotify or something and send it yeah. to their send it to their uh, friend and say listen i made this playlist for you i don't know what do people yeah do? you email it i suppose <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They, 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 you get tagged in the playlist yeah. that you made for that person. I don't know. Yeah. Are you a film person? Are you a film buff? You know, what's your relationship Oof. with the, obviously you love uh, Wes Anderson's films, which I do too. And that's was, was one of the things that appealed to me about this project. I was uh, intrigued, but uh, you know, what, how, what's your relationship with film and maybe a little more particular uh, Wes Anderson's films? I mean, I, it would be dangerous to call myself a, a film buff. <laughs> I mean, I certainly have seen a lot of movies. I enjoy a lot of movies. I have a lot of opinions about movies, but uh, you know, my, my field is really music. Um, and, you know, uh, there's just to speak about Wes Anderson. I, I don't know. I mean, there, I discovered his movies at a time in my life that um, they just really stuck. You know, uh, I probably saw, the Royal Tannenbaums when I was in my later high school years. And I just, he has such uh, a, a stylized element to his films and, uh, you know, themes of sort of uh, growing up and um, feeling stuck and, uh, you know, um, fantasy life and, and all these things that I could relate to at that age. And I guess I've always kind of related to, I'm a little bit of a Peter Pan in some senses. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think that he has a very emotionally driven storytelling and, and, and uh, a very keen sense for, for music and, and the power of it to create emotional scenes. Now, did you know that he was going to be coming out with a film uh, near the time that you were releasing this album? It's, it's, Yes and no. I mean, I started this project about two years ago, 
And then when I finished recording it in September, you know, then I'm like, I, I'm trying to shop it to record labels. I'm, I'm very lucky that I, I got to work with uh, Truth Revolution Recording Collective, which is Zakai Curtis's record label, which I'm super excited about it. And, uh, you know, they kind of encouraged me to release it over the summer to, to have a good timing with the, the movie release. And, you know, it, it seems like, uh, you know, the stars have aligned, I would say. What's the name of the new movie? I forget now. Oh, geez. Um, uh -oh, we both forgot. Asteroid City. Asteroid, Asteroid City. City. That's right. Yeah. That's good. I saw the trailer a few times. Yeah, it looks very cool. It's got the Wes Anderson thing going on for sure. Um, and speaking of the Wes Anderson thing, the aesthetic, uh, who created that extraordinary album cover for your release? And uh, how did you kind of guide them uh, to what did you envision? How did you sort of talk to that person about it? I, I'm so glad you asked. Well, um, I've been sort of stalking this uh, Reddit form, <laughs> the Wes Anderson Reddit form for a couple months to get inspiration for, you know, how to, to do the artwork for the album. And uh, there's this great artist I found, his name is Renan Campus. Um, and he had just posted some art that he made of characters from the film. And I, uh, I thought it would be a cool idea, something a little bit different to have uh, a sketch of myself in a Wes Anderson style drawing, you know, very symmetrical pastel colors, me and, right. me and Big Bertha over here in my yeah. base. Um, and, uh, I just, I love what he did with it. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, so, so many jazz albums are, are so, you know, serious and, and, you know, stoic. Um, it was very fun to have my album cover be a little bit more, uh, fun and, and, and vulnerable, I suppose. Right. Tell us about your upright back there. That's your main, uh, that's your main, uh, rig there. I imagine what, what yep. kind of base do you have there? Um, this is an Upton base, uh, company out of uh, Connecticut. Um, they do all custom American bases. Um, this one here, uh, I got back in 2015. Her name is Big Bertha, by the way. Okay, that wasn't uh, just a, a, a euphemism. That's no. really the name. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, I, I really, I love the instrument. Um, they had, they've designed it basically to my specifications. Um, I had, uh, you know, my first sort of professional base that I got when I got out of college, I'm a short guy and uh, I thought it would be a good idea to have a, a smaller base so that I wouldn't struggle with it as much. But what ended up happening is because it was small, it didn't produce as much sound. So I ended up really having some problems right. because I was working too hard to get that sound. So this base was designed sort of with some of that in mind to be uh, big in the right places, so to speak, and um, be very playable. And, um, you know, it fits me really well. And I'm really happy with what they did with it. And I love the color. It's a it's a nice, beautiful yes. dark. It's not dark. quite black. I get I can't quite see it on the screen. But what, yeah. what would you call that color? It's a it's a dark brown. It's dark it's brown. definitely it's got some nice shadowy things going on right now. It's really cool. It looks kind of matte too, right? Is it kind of matte, matte? Um, uh, I, I mean, you can see the grain when you when you get up close. Yeah, it looks great. It looks great. Although a, a matte finish on a base would would probably be pretty cool. Well, there we go. That'll be for your next one. Yeah. <laughs> Which probably will won't be for some time, right? Pro probably <laughs> um, uh, currently this album is available digitally or, or it will be in july right july yes 6th, july 7th july, july 7th. 7th is the release date yeah. uh, but i'd be lying if i didn't mention how much i'd love to see that artwork blown up to a 12 inch <sighs> album jacket and yeah. in fact i uh, my day job is uh, i'm an educator and i have a bulletin board in the hallway for the kids and it's it's evan's record collection and um i i cut out you know, just pictures of album covers every whenever I get around to it, every two months or so. And uh, this this uh, most recent uh, bulletin board that I made, I couldn't help but I cut yours out, so I put it up with all the other records. Oh, that's so I nice! Thank you. It up a little bit. It, it's a little bit bigger. That's um, awesome. But have you thought about uh, vinyl uh, for this release? I have absolutely thought about it. I really would like to do it i uh you know this is the first album i've ever released i've been working in the industry for almost 20 years um and it's uh it's a big it's a big leap and it's an expensive process right. and uh you know I, I one of the things that the label suggested to me that i could always do is i could pick an anniversary date one year anniversary five year anniversary and do a re-release at that time i'm still thinking about having a, a vinyl release but for right now, we're we're going to stick with just uh, streaming and CDs. 
Well, it sounds great. The The waves that I heard sound terrific, and uh, you got a really great sound on here, and you've got some terrific players on the release. And, of course, I want to talk about the fabulous vocalist on the project, but describe some of the other players, some of the instrumentalists on this release. Are they folks you'd worked with before, or who, who do you have with you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the core band is kind of like a, a seven-piece band. We have Sean Noel on saxophone, Rick Becker on drums, our vocalist is named Sammy Stevens. She's fantastic. Uh, guitarist is Allison Yaffe. Pianist is Marta Sanchez. And then the drummer is Rodrigo Ricabarin, and I play bass. Um, and that core band is all uh, people that are my peers, people who are all like really established in the jazz scene in New York and who I'm in awe, awe of all the time. Right. Um, and then some of the special guests that I got, I included, uh, obviously, Nir Felder, who's my favorite guitarist, um, and uh, Rich Perry, uh, saxophonist, and my favorite saxophonist. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I definitely wanted to, when I decided to make this record, I definitely wanted it to be something that sort of featured my community. I didn't want it just to be like an all-star album because, you know, I, I, I want to um, lift up the people whom, whom I work with and sort of give a picture of my life and, and you know, the artists whom I admire. Um, but also, you know, this is one of the few opportunities I would have to really uh, do something creative in the studio with, you know, some of my heroes. So that was definitely something I appreciated, uh, you know, getting the chance to do. Right. So who is the vocalist on this project? You just said her name. Sammy Stevens. Sammy Stevens. And does she sing all of the vocals? Basically all the vocals. There's one song that we have, uh, this French bossa nova singer, uh, Ramsey Rawson comes in and sings on Rebel Rebel. But Sammy sings everything else, yeah. Now, it's interesting because as I was sort of going through listening to the record a few times, I thought, oh, there's a couple of different people singing here <laughs> because right? uh, she she really does, uh, she's chameleon-like with her, yeah. her vocals. And in fact, in some parts, and I was driving around with my son and I thought it was a, a male singer, a male male singer. He's going, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm like, doesn't he sound great? This guy sounds great. What a great <laughs> voice. And my son, who's 10 years old, he's, what are you talking about, dad? That's a, that's a female. <laughs> I, said, I don't know. I think it's like just a tenor range. Uh... Anyway, it was the same person. But tell me about the terrific vocals that uh, uh, yeah. she recorded for this Well, record. it's interesting because, um, you know, I have, I, I, I wrote a lot of these charts before I considered uh, who would be singing them and stuff. So I kind of just wrote them in the key that I wrote whatever song in. Um, but, but, Sammy's such a a dynamic singer that she was like, no, I want to do this in this this key, and um, you know, it it's really remarkable that it, it just the range of her voice and she's able to sort of capture these different moods of songs, right. and you know, she really liked having an because normally you know singers they have like sort of keys that they work in the most, and this was sort of an opportunity and a challenge for her that she really enjoyed singing in all these different places in her voice, and it really is incredible. Yeah. And so how did you sort of debate, uh, you know, did you have a moment where you were saying, should this just be an instrumental album or, um, you know, did you sort of, were you thinking one direction or the other, or when did you think to mm. add vocals to this? Um, I think I always, I mean, the, the first, the first thing I did to start this project is I wrote, uh, what became that arrangement of Stephanie says, which is the Velvet Underground song, the first song on the album. Uh, and I posted some stuff online and I said to, you know, my audience, like, would it be a cool idea if I made sort of a, a Wes Anderson album, you know, like a sort of concept where they're all songs from, from a Wes Anderson movie. Oh, I see. Okay, and they're cool. like, you know, yeah, that sounds fun. So that, that's sort of one of the big pieces that started that uh, project. And that was an instrumental song. Um, but as I started exploring the other stuff I wanted to do on this album, uh, you know, I, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to have a vocalist and that I wanted to have Sammy specifically. Um, cause I just feel like instrumental albums that are based on other material, they have, there's a lot of really great ones, but it, it, it's, 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 it's a challenge in and of itself, uh, to, to not sound like just sort of covers of it, having a, a vocalist there gave us the opportunity to sort of explore the songs as songs and, and not just sort of like uh, vehicles for, for improvisation. 
Right. And um, uh, it, it's interesting, too, because people are also familiar with the lyrics as much yeah. as they are the, the, the melody. Absolutely. So, you ha you know, you, you sort of hit all the bases there, I think. And so let's go through the track listing just so our listeners who maybe don't have this um, album in front of them or they don't have the track listing in front of them and they should check this out. But let's let them know what's on the album. So you mentioned Stephanie says this is uh, Velvet Underground tune and that was in... Royal Tenenbaums? Yes. Okay. So that's, there we go. I want to locate everything. I want to try to locate <laughs> everything. Okay. Uh, the Way I Feel Inside uh, is a zombie song. Yep. Right? And um, who just came out with a great new record. I don't know if you I know. It. Yeah. No, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. You should check it out. It's really good. Um, so what was, is that also, what, what was that in? Life Aquatic. Okay. okay. That's uh, Owen Wilson's death sing. They play oh, that song. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I know the movies, but I'm I'm a little uh, hazy on them. Um, <laughs> Life on Mars was Life Aquatic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you've got your Bowie T-shirt on today. I do, yes. Uh, Needle in the Hay, which is probably one of my favorite uh, musical moments in a Wes Anderson film, yeah. is uh, Elliot Smith. I'm, I love Elliot Smith. You can't. Li I always tell people you can't Ooh. listen to too much Elliot Smith. You got to take him in small <laughs> doses, otherwise you you might go off the rails. Yeah, but, that's true um, too. I do love that uh, song and the treatment in the film, and um, and I love your version as well. Uh, I was really intrigued at, when I saw the the track listing. I went, "How the heck are they going to do this? What are they going to do?" And I think you did a terrific job. What, Thank you. Talk, I appreciate can you talk that. a little bit about that that sure. song in particular. Yeah. So the the beginning of the arrangement, the first sort of concept of the arrangement I had was to just sort of take that iconic guitar riff that uh, is the you know sort of main hook of the song and put it on the bass. And so that opens up the space to sort of use the other instruments to ornament it. And so our, our sort of first pass through the melody is uh, very uh, just sort of exploring low sounds and, and uh, against this familiar melody. Um, and slowly the song sort of builds steam until we get to having kind of a rock groove underneath it. And then what we ended up doing is sort of writing a new composition in, in the middle of the song, sort of like turning it into a suite. Yes. And uh, the the new sort of suite that emerges is just sort of a, a meditation on on loss and, and death and grief and just sort of the themes that are explored through um, the scene in the Wes Anderson movie, which is talking about suicide, the themes that are explored in Elliot Smith's music and and the sort of tragic end of his life, which was he also committed suicide. Um, maybe, and, maybe. Oh, is that there are there are fan theories about that? I didn't know that. I'll have to do some. I'll have to go back on Reddit. There are some theories out there. Interesting. We don't have to get into what they are, but yeah, yeah. check it out. It's a. It's a, who knows. Who knows? Yeah. So, uh, and then sort of, you know, going through the suite and then emerging uh, back into the original song and this time at a, at a faster, more frantic tempo. And we sort right. of end on some of the sort of more avant-garde themes that we explored in the, the middle section. Oh, it was beautiful. Incredibly well thought out and uh, very Thank impressive. I, I, I hope people listen to the, uh, to the record after we're done talking about it. Rebel Rebel was, of course, in Life Aquatic again. Yes. A lot of Bowie in, in that film. Yeah, I'm realizing now I really sort of <laughs> centered around the Royal Tannenbaums and Life Aquatic. I guess this is one of my favorite movies. What can I well, say? And you have the red beanie, the Jacques Cousteau yes. red beanie on the cover, of course. Yeah. So, so that's, that's okay. What's So Long? What is So Long? Now, So Long is a song by this, an artist named Steady Holiday, um, whom I found on a Spotify Wes Anderson playlist. Okay. And uh, this was right before the French Dispatch came out. And I thought at that time, um, I, the album might be coming out sooner. It might be a good idea to have something from the French Dispatch on it. Um, and it was never in that movie or any Wes Anderson movie. So I'm not exactly sure how it made it into this playlist, but hmm. I really, I, I, I just came to really like the song and it, it certainly has this sort of, you know, um, there's this sort of emotional thread that goes between all these sort of Wes Anderson song choices that is sort of undescribable. I, I can't necessarily find the words right now to say what that is that connects them because it's not genre it's really an emotion right um and 
you know, it, it just kind of, it kind of fit the album. You know, it's a song about, it's a love song that that's told during a breakup, you know, like it's as you're breaking up, you know, you deserve all these wonderful things. And, uh, you know, I set it to a little bit more of a uh, New Orleans groove, uh, something that felt sort of joyful and, and optimistic. And it seemed like a really nice place in the album to sort of, you know, send the listener off on a, on a, in a to a happier sort of conclusion. And okay. so I decided to, to include it in the album. All right. And Cello's song, you say, of course, was a Nick Drake song, but it really wasn't in a Wes Anderson movie. But you could, of course, see. Has has he ever used Nick Drake? Yes, there's a, there's a lot of Nick Drake, especially in the Royal Tannenbaums, and I believe in some other uh, movies as well. Okay. And, of course, these days, what I really love, that's a, a Nico Velvet Underground kind of a thing written by, of course, Jackson Brown. What a great yes. tune. Yeah. One of my favorites. One of my favorite songs of all time, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. Is it unfair for me to ask uh, a favorite uh, favorite Wes Anderson movie? Whew. Well, is that I, unfair? Not at all. I mean, I've been sort of preparing for this question, uh, and I went back and I I rewatched some of my favorite movies, which you know, as you can see from the album, the Royal Tannenbaums and, and Life Aquatic. Right. And uh, I I think because those movies have always been the movies that I've compared all other movies to, it feels like those are his best movies. But I, I think rewatching them so many years later, it's interesting to me that. You know, despite the fact that he is someone, a type of artist who has found a style and really tried to just continually de dive deeper into that style and not break expectations by doing something different like other artists do, you know, it's, it's, right. it's always sort of a, the Wes Anderson film in many ways. But I think that sort of you're being maybe very his diplomatic. movies. You're, you're really think... hedging your bets. You're being okay. very diplomatic here. <laughs> I think that his movies may have actually gotten better. You know, I think that the, the his style of filmmaking, I mean, you only really get to uh, experience something new once, you know, that's why like, you know, whoever your favorite artist, like the, when I listened to Kid A from Radiohead, like nothing else compares to that, you know, but like, I think there is sort of um, a development in his films that, uh, you know, I continue to, to get better. So we'll see. We'll see what my favorite so is. So there's no the answers. Of... There's no answer. Well, okay, no. It's, it's Royal Tannenbaums and Life Aquatic are, are my favorite <laughs> Okay, films. good. I like two. Two's good. Yeah. I think if I had to answer, I'd say Royal Tannenbaums, which I really love. And I love uh, Grand Budapest. Yeah, I was also going to say Grand Budapest. I, I love I, that I think movie. that one is, and of course, Darjeeling Limited, fantastic film. But yeah. I love Grand Bud. I really yeah. love that. Uh, what is some? Is there a good musical? What's a good musical moment in that in that film? That I'm not. Thinking? They use a lot of the this uh, mandolin concerto, right? And, and that and in one of in one of our performances, you know, just for a live concert, I had arranged uh, a medley of sort of um, the interstitial music that he uses in his right. films, right? Um, but it didn't really feel right to put on the album. Of course, you had a lot of songs to choose from. You had several films to think about. Uh, were there any songs that didn't quite make the cut? Anything came really close or any outtakes that you said, oh, this was close, but we're going to leave this off? There were. Uh, there were some. I, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, this is sort of, this is my mixtape. This is, the, these have to be the songs that are, are my favorite songs, uh, you know, to sort of get across the mixtape concept. And, um, you know, I, I tried to use some music from his later films, but they, they just, uh, the, the arrangements didn't come to me as naturally because they just weren't my songs, you know? Right, right. Um, and so they did not make the cut. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure the musicians, I would imagine, thought this was a really cool project. Did you get any uh, interesting feedback from the people you were playing with? I was, yeah. You know, people love his films, and uh, our, our, our certain uh, generation really love the movies, too. So I'd imagine you got a lot of good feedback. Yeah. I mean, everybody's been super supportive about this project, which has been awesome. I mean, there was uh, a little bit of a legal question for a while if I could use... Wes Anderson's name on on the cover of the album, and um, I, when I at that point I was like, okay, I guess I'm just gonna have to name it someone else. And it was actually Nier who was like, you have to name it, you know, it, you have to find a way to to make this project connected to Wes Anderson because that's just gonna make the album pop. And you know, 
Uh, I'm really glad he pushed me on. I got, I talked to a lawyer and all that stuff. So we were able to sort of get away with it by saying inspired by the films of Wes Anderson. Right. Very cool. Well, and as far as I know about copyright, you can't really copyright a um, name title. Right, or a title. Yeah. So yeah. if you wanted to call something the, the living history of Bruce Springsteen, you know, you could kind of do it without... From what I understand, it, there, there, there may be there, some legal questions about that, that it, this isn't a legal podcast, so there's no need to get into it. But right. um, yeah, just some people had advised me to be careful. But I think what we came up with actually works and, and shouldn't be a problem. Cool. Um, you're interesting back to you, you know, uh, away, moving away from the project for a second. Your bio says one of the first songs you learned was a Deftones tune. Oh, yeah. And that's a long way, of course, from your playing now. Can you tell our audience a little bit about what I imagine your musical eclectic taste is? Sure, sure. I mean, um, it's a it's my own summer by the Deftones. Do 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 It's just just like such a great riff, you know. And it that has I've never forgotten it. And in some ways, it's it's worked into little songs that I've written over the years. But yeah, I mean, you know, I the my introduction to music is was through my dad. He used to play instruments and stuff. And uh, he died when I was 10 years old. And one of the things that I did during that time was take up his bass guitar. And that's how I started to learn how to play uh, an instrument and why it's always been so important to me. Um, and in those early years, you know, it's kind of like uh, I was just learning whatever I could, rock and roll, stuff like that. Uh, you know, being a bass player, you get a chance to play in bands and stuff right. like that because everybody wants to play the guitar or the drums or something like that. So. There's a there was a made me feel a part of something. There's a community aspect to, to music that I you know appreciated. Um, I think that in my sort of earlier years, I, I, I got into this whole idea of sort of finding rare music, and and um, there that was something that interested me, sort of finding unconventional music because I felt a little bit like I was an outsider in some ways, and like stuff that other people were into were not for me right um and that aspect has always been a part of you know how i uh see music and hear music although i certainly have come around to uh having such strong anti-pop feelings that i did when i was a teenager um but you know as i d continued to develop learning you know uh and getting better at my instrument uh i started studying jazz and, and learning about improvisation. And, um, you know, that was just something that really caught fire for me, being able to um, express myself and, uh, you know, perform music with other people that we were creating in the moment um, is is really fun and, 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 you know, has a lot of artistic merit. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, I have an eclectic taste. I, I love classical music. I work a lot in musical theater and I perform with all different kinds of, uh, you know, singers and songwriters. And uh, I think everything at this point of my life is sort of based in jazz. It would be hard for me to imagine creating an album that wasn't in some ways a jazz album. But, you know, I also didn't grow up with the kind of um, music that most jazz musicians perform, you know, that's the great American songbook, you know, the songs I learned later in life, the, the songs that sort of hit closer to home to me are, are these indie rock and, uh, you know, under the radar music that, you know, I really enjoy. Right. And uh, I'm a piano player and a singer, too. And, uh, you know, I played uh, in a lot of New York City cabarets. And it's in interesting you bring up the Great American Songbook. I'm always interested to bring up to folks how much that songbook has changed. And if you go to a, uh, you know, a piano bar nowadays in New York City, you'd be very surprised the songs that you're hearing. You're certainly not hearing what you were hearing 25 years ago. That is absolutely true. Yeah. I don't know if you're hearing a lot of Deftones tunes, but you're definitely hearing <laughs> something something that's uh, a more contemporary. And, yeah. and, and it's interesting how that Great American Songbook does change uh, every uh, you know generation, every 20, 30 years. It's not, it's not what it used to be, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you have to, you know, as a jazz musician, you have to uh, adapt to it a little bit more because those songs that were written in the, you know, 
1920s through 1950s, like harmony was just uh, a little bit different, you know, in terms of the structure of songs and those kind of uh, more harmonic movements uh, and key changes and stuff is, is what we are used to as jazz improv improvisers, songs that sort of stay on one or two or three chords. It's, it's, it's a different kind of improvisation and, and, you know, you have to be a little bit more creative with the arrangement sometimes to make it feel like, uh, you know, a, a jazz song. Right. Make it work. Um, you've got some other, uh, obviously this project is taking up your time and energy right now, but you've got some other musical projects. Would you like to tell uh, our audience a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. Um, well, I've just been in DC for the past month, uh, performing this John Adams opera called, uh, looking at the ceiling. And then I saw the sky, which is, a an earthquake romance set in 1994. Um, it's with, uh, in series opera company. Um, I have a, a trio with, uh, my two of my favorite collaborators, Alison Yaffe, the guitarist and Eric Reeves, uh, the drummer. Um, and, uh, you know, we're called the like minds trio and we perform, uh, you know, all over New York city. We're, we're booking some tours for the Midwest in September. Um, I collaborate with, uh, you know, I, I, most of my other work is, is, is freelance, but uh, I play with a bunch of different other groups. Those, those are the trio and uh, the band and, and uh, you know, this opera project has been sort of what's been on my radar, so to speak, for the past uh, couple months. Cool. And uh, here's, a, here's a big question. And I'm just going to put this out into the world. Is there any chance that you think Wes Anderson might hear about this project? And what if he decided to use one of your tracks in, in one of his upcoming films? Sure. I mean, that's the dream, right? Well, I'm, I would, putting, I'm putting it out into the universe and yeah. what track would it be well that's the question it's gotta it's probably gotta be like a cello song or something that's not already in his movie you so know you thought about this you, you purposely <laughs> put two songs that weren't really in film <laughs> thinking that he would uh would, wow what a genius would, i am i didn't even right. know Right. He would email me and say, listen, you got away with using my name in the title. <laughs> so I'm going to use this one in the film. Deal. It's, you got it, it, sir. It's a deal. It's a handshake <laughs> deal. Well, cool. Anything else I, uh, I'm i forgetting about or I'm not mentioning that you'd like to share with everybody? Uh, No, no. I think that was a great, wonderful conversation. Good. Well, it's a wonderful project. It sounds great. It's uh, like I said, the theme is terrific. It's you, you've got a, a you put together a really cleverly um, organized project and between the artwork and the music. And you got a great group of people to uh, help you along here. And I hope that people take time out to listen to it. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much for your time, Evan.